And the story starts, as you might expect, at, at camp. Um, like I said, I, I've been, I've been uh, working for the American Camp Association for almost seven years, and for most of those years, I've been uh, sharing out the findings of what has changed names several times, but I think we've landed on the National Camp Impact Study. The study actually uh, kind of launched right when I started at the American Camp Association. And one of the tenets of the study is that we would have findings to share along the way. So even as early as year one, uh, I was going to regional conferences, our national conference, and sharing with folks what we were learning. And it was always very good. Uh, my job is actually quite easy. I get to talk about a thing I love uh, with people that also love that thing. Uh, as much as I know that there are doubters, uh, I don't actually have to interact with them, so that makes talking about camp quite, quite fun. Um, but this is, a, this is different for me because I'm gonna remember back to some times when talking about camp uh, was not so easy. Uh, before working for ACA, like Jim mentioned, I was a professor. Um, talking about camp was pretty easy there because I generally had students. Uh, that were, had been to camp, had worked at camp, maybe even wanted to do camp research, and so they were the good part. But before that, I was a camp director. I was a day camp director, uh, like many of you are, and uh, I have to tell you, talking about camp, uh, explaining camp, trying to maybe explain the value of camp was extremely difficult, extremely difficult. You all know this better than I do, but um, what, what made it difficult, I don't know if it was the context, but I, I ran a day camp that was on the campus of a, of a K through 12 independent school. And the school was and is amazing, perhaps the most well-endowed school in the area in terms of facilities and classrooms and supplies and teachers. And I took this job thinking, great, because I had been a student teacher before this, mind you, at a charter school that didn't have uh, so much as a playground ball. So I, I'm used to working with very little. So I take this job at a day camp um, thinking that I have access to just world-class space and materials. And my very first day, I show up um, ready to get, we had a, a, about 12 hours to transition from the school year into camp year. And so I brought a team with me. We were ready to start making this campus a camp. And there was caution tape across every classroom, across the library, across the PE equipment, and I'm not lying, the playing fields. They would not let us play on the grass. So there it was, run a camp, do great things, but you can't touch any stuff. So that began one of many positions where I was asked to uh, explain the value of camp to, to people who really didn't get it and probably didn't value it. Um, but perhaps the most difficult time I had explaining camp was actually when I was a kid. I went to a, quite a lot of camp I was an only child, so of course my parents were pretty eager to get that one out the door and I'm gonna do some other things. Um, so I went to day camps all summer. Uh, I went to day camps at a, at a YMCA camp. I was a CIT at that camp. Uh, in preparation for this talk, I went through some old camp stuff and actually found my original uh, CIT job description, um, which for not that many, but still a lot of years ago, was somewhat relevant. Along with that job description, I found a form, a registration form, that said at the top, please complete this form and turn in to the BR Ryle YMCA immediately. Obviously, I hadn't turned in the form. <laughs> It was with my job description. So um, that was my day camp experience. I did Girl Scout camp. Uh, I did band camp, of course. And then, uh, but most meaningfully, I did it overnight camp starting um, at two weeks at a time. That moved into six weeks at a time and then eight weeks at a, at a time. That's called Honey Rock Camp up in northern Wisconsin, still alive and well, and um, still have um, most of who I am to tie and to thank to camp. That's why I'm here. It's why so many of us are here. But um, I remember a lot about camp. Uh, especially because I was an only child, I remember that every year there was a, a theme, and we never knew what the theme was. Um, but we take the bus, starting, you know, get on the bus in the suburbs of Chicago, ride the bus up with that like nice soup of anticipation and nervousness, like on the bouncy roads. And then uh, Honey Rock, and I actually don't know, I should check this, um, but at least our kid lore was that Honey Rock was on Highway X. And I remember we'd hit Highway X and the bus would get really quiet. And somewhere on Highway X, you never knew where, but somewhere you'd stop, and a bunch of staff would jump on the bus and they'd be dressed as something, and they would roll out this theme and they'd hand you this stuff, and that was your ticket for camp. 
And I was blown away. Like, these people do all of this for us. They're like super dressed up and super like this whole make-believe thing. And one year it was a Wizard of Oz thing. We get off the bus and it was a red brick road, a red brick road that we got to walk up to the field where there was more staff dressed up, playing games, and, and that was it. And that was it. And then two weeks would be gone. And I had the time of my life. And for an only child, to be in that kind of noise was, was what I dreamed for. So camp was a big deal for me. Um, I made my best friends at camp, looked forward to camp every year. Uh, but coming home from camp was extremely, extremely hard because I came home, um, one, to a, a very loving but quiet household. Very quiet. My, my parents did not like noise. I mean, there's a reason they only had one child. They did not like noise. I was not allowed to watch television. Definitely no junk food and definitely no big emotions, right? They wanted everything to be calm. And so I come back from camp with lots of big emotions and there wasn't space for that. There wasn't space for that. I remember my parents, again, very loving. You know, this is what you learn as a grown up is that your parents always did the very best they could, right? Um, but I remember my parents just kind of smiling and nodding and saying, just let us know when you're back to normal. Of course, as a kid, I said, no, but th 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 this is normal. This is me. Um, but they were doing the best they could. They didn't know camp. They actually didn't know this camp. I come to find out they didn't know this camp very well. They have a friend of theirs sent their kid to camp, and it was good enough for them, and so off you go. Um, and, and this camp ended up being very transformative in my life. So you know, it was really never very easy to explain camp to my parents. They knew I was different. They didn't know quite what to make of it, and I didn't know how to explain why. So luckily, they let me keep going back. Um, but perhaps the hardest audience were my friends. I, I, I um, did not live in the town where most of the kids that went to this camp lived. I was a good 45 minutes away. So whereas they all went back to their schools and their churches and they knew each other, I went back to mine and it was very, very far apart. I went back to um, an area also very loving and safe and supportive. I'm very, very privileged in that way. Um, and my friends had all gone to soccer camp and they came back with trophies and they came back with guaranteed positions on the school sports teams and I came back with a very ratty, dirty arm of friendship bracelets. <laughs> and by gum, I was gonna wear every one of those friendship bracelets for as long as I could until people started asking about them. Like, what's that? But it's camp, I went to camp, we got to do this cool stuff. No, they didn't, they didn't get it, right? So you don't go to camp, you don't understand camp. And so I knew when I was young that um, camp was something that uh, was kinda unique to me and, and maybe um, something that made me separate from everybody else. You know, and I, I didn't know what to make it. Obviously, it led me here, but I knew that I needed a better way to explain camp. I needed a better way to tell people what this thing was that was happening to me. I knew it was good, right? So fast forward many years, and of course, I landed at camp um, to work. Where else would I go? Um, and I worked at Clearwater Camp in Wisconsin. And in one of those years at Clearwater Camp, um, the director at the time, Sonny Moore, an absolute legend in our field, said, we've been randomly selected to participate in a research study. I need someone to help me pass out surveys. Anyone want to do this? And I said, yep. <laughs> and I, I, I think I gave myself a title. It was something like, like survey passer outer. And uh, actually didn't put it on my resume <laughs> to, uh, to good effect, because here we are. Um, but in that role, I, I, I no lie, I signed up to kind of be this coordinator for Clearwater Camp, and, and part of that role was getting these big boxes from the American Camp Association and passing out uh, surveys to staff, uh, to campers, I believe also to parents, um, also crisp $1 bills. The researcher in me today is like, why didn't I put those in my pocket? But I didn't. I actually did give them to the participants for filling out those surveys. Uh, part of that job was going to the Mid-States Camp Conference way, way back to get trained. Um, and I'll never forget, uh, it's where I met Chris Thurber for the first time. I mean, here I, I was maybe 20. I was maybe 20 and introduced to the American Camp Association, introduced to a thing that was about explaining camp. And it blew my mind. It wasn't just me. 
it wasn't just me having these experiences and coming home transformed. It was other people too, and there's an entire organization dedicated to that thing. So thus began a journey uh, that has led me to here today. Um, that study that I, that I told you about, that I got to pass out surveys, turned out to be the first national outcome study, the first research project that, that really laid down for the first time what we would now call the social emotional benefits of attending camp. If you read the study, if you've been in camp, it's, it's a no-duh study, right? We know these things happen. In fact, camp research goes all the way back to the 1940s, I think, is one of the first documented studies we have. And they're talking about the same stuff. They call it something different. Um, but this idea that camp promotes these outcomes is not new. But that study was the first of its kind to look at it on a national scale, look at it from the perspective of campers, staff, parents and actually show quantitatively that attending camp produces outcomes like, I believe some of them were teamwork and independence and interest in exploration, and this was good. At the time we called this positive youth development, we could say confidently and with evidence that camp was a context for positive youth development. And that study is still very powerful. I know, I see the metrics. People still down the report, people still cite the, uh, those original journal articles. What that study didn't do for us, and you know, any single research project cannot do all of the things. What that study did not do for us is tell us confidently if those outcomes last. So that study wrapped in the early 2000s and initially set, in a, you know, a, a kind of set in motion then uh, initiative to gear up for the next study, which was essentially to determine if those outcomes last. So here we are today, we're here to learn about the impact study. I'm finally there to tell you a little bit about the impact study, uh, but of course there's a little bit of uh, a background. And for those of you who have been uh, with us for the last five years and hearing about the impact study, I share this background pretty much every time because it's important. Any time we're listening or reading research, we have to do our due diligence. So I wanna serve up a little bit of this due diligence for you. I'm gonna tell you some of the things that we have done to make this research reliable, to make this research something that you can use, not only to improve your practice, but to take to funders, to parents, to others that might be looking for actual evidence. So what we did, uh, first and foremost, is uh, say, okay, we know in general, we wanna know uh, about the lasting outcomes of camp, but from there, we're way too close to this. We're way too excited about camp, and by we at this point, I mean the American Camp Association. We're way too close to this to, to really set our own direction and very uh, far too biased about camp to actually do our research. So we, we gathered a, a group of volunteers at the time uh, and, and tasked them with giving us a direction. Okay, so we knew in general we wanna know this, this lasting outcomes of camp, but what is the direction? What, are, what is the question that we want to ask? And, and that group, um, you know, it was not easy. It was not easy because, you know, the, the lasting outcomes of camp uh, is actually going to take a very large investment. In fact, at the time, it was a half million dollar investment to study this thing. So we better have some pretty clear direction. So that, that group came up with the kind of the, the key question of the study, which was this. Do camp experiences prepare young people for life outside of camp? If so, how? It's a pretty simple question. Uh, but in there are a couple key points. And one is young people. In fact, that is not part of the original question, so I'm, I'm, I'm riffing on that a little bit. But um, the original question was campers. Do camp experiences prepare campers for life beyond camp? Um, but very quickly, our good friends at uh, ACA New York, New Jersey, recognized the value in asking these exact same questions for staff, right? We know that staff are on their, the same developmental journey, not the same, but a developmental journey in the same ways that campers are. So if we're gonna kind of get this machinery in action to capture the lasting outcomes of camp, we better do that for staff. So our study very much is about campers and staff and thinking about these in parallel ways. Um, the next part that is really important to note is the how. Okay, so we didn't just ask what the lasting outcomes of camp are, we asked how. And that's not something that's easy to ask, you know, especially in camp when that how for us is something we would very lovingly call just the magic of camp. It's the magic of camp. It just happens, right? Well, it doesn't just happen, you know, a lot goes into that. First and foremost, they, you know, you all go into that. Our professionals with skills and abilities go into that. 
Uh, but we needed to unpack that from a research point of view. So this question really was about what are the lasting outcomes and how. So with that in motion, um, as we like to do at ACA, we, uh, we got another committee to take that question and, and basically bring it to bear and say, okay, who is going to do this research for us? How are we gonna choose an institution that is going to um, answer this question the most rigorous way possible? And then how are we gonna make sure that, that that institution is doing the research in a way that is reliable, that is trustworthy, and stays true to the questions that we want answered? So we put out a call to proposals. Several institutions um, submitted some very interesting projects, um, but that committee selected the team from the University of Utah, and several of our team are here, including Dr. Jim Sibthorpe, who introduced me. Um, and, and, and that was really exciting. You know, obviously I went to school <laughs> at the University of Utah. I also lived down the street from the University of Utah. Uh, but more importantly, the University of Utah had a history um, going all the way back to that original outcome study. So we're able to truly build on uh, what we knew about outcomes and what we didn't. And they knew that we didn't know that stickiness factor and that we didn't know the how factor. So the, the basic design of the study uh, was what we call inductive, meaning really kind of starting with this assumption that we don't know a whole lot. Uh, we identified outcomes back in the early 2000s that were outcomes at the time we knew um, happened because of camp, but we didn't know if those were the same outcomes that would last over time. So we really kind of had to go back to the beginning. So this inductive um, design allowed us to explore, okay, what are the lasting outcomes of camp? Okay, and I'm gonna give you a little bit more detail about each of these phases, but wanna paint the whole picture. So let's explore what the lasting outcomes of camp, then let's see how those outcomes of camp kind of play with each other. How do they map out against each other? That was phase two. And then we're gonna track these outcomes over time. Okay, to see how they actually uh, move with a cohort of campers. So getting all the way back to, to phase one. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we learned, but really the, the upshot here is the, the kind of the sum total of our findings. Um, I do wanna say I'm not gonna touch on the staff findings today, and I apologize, I know that's something that is of great interest. Um, you can read all about what we learned about staff. Uh, the full report is avail available for download as well as a staff-specific report. Um, and then you can always come find me and ask more about staff. But I'm gonna focus on the camper outcomes today. So in that phase one, the very exploratory phase, we knew we had to talk to some folks who were uh, kind of beyond their childhood camp experience. We knew if we were interested in the lasting outcomes of camp, you know, and how those outcomes of camp are used outside of camp, we had to get with some folks who were um, actually living lives outside of camp. So for that, we uh, looked to 18 to 25 year olds. You know, we, we want to talk to folks whose camp experience was close enough that they had something to reflect on, but that was also far enough away that they could step back and say, yeah, here's what I learned, and here's how I'm using it today. But there's an important detail in this group of folks that we reached out that is always really important to throw out, and that is that we recruited this sample of, of 18 to 25 year olds, all alumni of camps, from a sample of ACA accredited camps, okay? And you know, they could be, make sense in a space like this, right? This is American Camp Association, of course, we're only gonna look at uh, ACA accredited camps. But this was actually um, an intentional but not easy decision. Intentional um, because the, this committee that was making sort of decisions about shaping the study acknowledged that by sampling only within ACA accredited camps, we are limiting ourselves to a sliver of the overall universe of camps that exist and probably a very biased sliver. If you're here representing a, a, an accredited camp, you know that seeking and maintaining accreditation is no easy lift. It requires staff time, it requires resources that not every camp has. So it's likely a bias that represents a segment of camps that have resources and, and likely have resources because they're serving a population that has resources, right? So we knew that we were going to be biasing our data from the get-go. But we also were, uh, knew that that was allowing us a base level of uh, kind of definition of camp. 
You know, I always say in our work, we've, we've avoided defining camps. Camps exist in backyards. Camps exist in church basements. They exist at Build-A-Bear. They exist everywhere. And we actually don't want to limit what we consider a camp. But for research purposes, variability is not a good thing. We want things to be as same-like as possible. And so we knew that accred accreditation would provide that base level um, of, of, of kind of that, the, the camp variable. Uh, most importantly, though, we knew we had to sample within ACA accredited camps because we had their phone numbers. <laughs> so um, with that in mind, we sampled, uh, we asked 20, about 20 ACA accredited camps. And mind you, we were intentional about the 20 we selected. We tried to get day camps and overnight camps, camps from all uh, across the country, camps of different uh, sizes and fo focuses. I know it's not a word, but go with me. Um, with the intent that we weren't interested in any one camp, we were interested in what I would call the camp experience, right? We wanted sort of this, this um, kind of meta concept of camp, right? So recruited this original alumni sample from the ACA accredited camps um, and first went to them with an interview. Again, this is all exploratory. We don't know what they were using then in their lives, um, but we did that through an interview. And what we generated from those interviews is a list of 18 different outcomes. Um, that, that really were common across all roughly 75 interviews that we conducted. And, oh, now I'm back on, thank you. Uh, and those, those, inter those outcomes were things that we were familiar with, a lot of teamwork, relationship skills, stuff that we had seen in our original study, and also some new ones. One that I'll share with you um, that we're still kind of wrestling with but has been so intriguing and you'll know why, uh, is what we call appreciation for being present. Huh. Now, mind you, these are 18 to 25-year-olds reflecting back on their time at camp as a kid. Is there some nostalgia in here? Maybe. Is there some, oh, I'm adulting now and life's getting hard? Maybe. But the more we unpacked it, the more we realized there's actually something really curious about this being present in the moment. So I want you to hang on to that one. I'm going to come back to it. But that started to emerge within that first round of data. Okay. So. Qualitative data allowed us then to take these 18 outcomes and build a survey with the attempt to uh, quantify them. We wanted to see how these outcomes actually stacked up against one another um, with the intent of understanding uh, the, what, what we call the distinct and transferable nature of these outcomes, right? We wanted to know not only um, were they being used outside of camp, but to what extent, what, which of these outcomes were the most transferable, okay, that's one part. And then the second part is, which were the most attributable to camp? We didn't go into this pretending that camp did everything. We didn't go into this pretending that camp was the only place that young people, uh, young people were learning these kind of things. What we wanted to know is what was camp's unique contribution to these outcomes. Okay, so phase two was another pass at another sample of 18 to 25 year olds, this time with a survey, so it was a larger sample, and in fact we had two samples. One was yet again uh, folks from ACA accredited camps, but we also um, went to a sample in the general public that had some kind of camp experience as a kid. We had to pay a research firm to do this, remember, because we didn't have phone numbers for anybody, but research firms tend to find them. Uh, they did, and they were able to test this bias that we thought that we had in our, in our uh, accredited sample, which indeed played out. Um, but what we were able to do is map these outcomes against each other, and I'm using this visual because I don't have slides, but what, what I want you to imagine with me is, is a four-box typology. Okay, and what's in the upper right-hand column or right-hand corner um, would be the outcomes of these 18 outcomes that are most transferable, meaning what we found in the data as the most important in daily life and also most attributable to camp. Right, so there were outcomes like, um, let's just say, relationship skills, that was actually one that was quite strong, that was very, very attributable or very, very important in life but young people, or our emerging adults, sorry, in the sample were saying, yeah, but I'm learning that in a lot of places, uh, right? So it wasn't necessarily the most attributable to camp. The outcomes that landed in this, this upper quadrant, the most important in daily life, the most attributable to camp, then became the fodder for phase three. Okay, and phase three is really the focus of the findings that, I, that I'm bringing to you today. So that was a a lot of background to, to, to get you to this point to say, for the first time at a national scale in phase three, we 
uh, recruited a sample of campers. At the time, they were nine years old, nine and 10 years old, and we recruited them with a parent or caregiver. Uh, we wanted to talk to campers alongside a parent or caregiver for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, I will note that yet again, this, this sample of campers and caregivers were recruited from a sample of ACA accredited camps, but yet again, once we uh, ha got access to the campers and their parents or caregivers, the camps really stepped away. I don't have anything to say about the camps they attended. I don't have anything to say whether it was a good camp experience or not. All we have is the perspective of the campers and the caregivers, right? Because we're more interested in this kind of larger construct of the camp experience. So about four years ago, we started with a sample of nine and 10 year olds. We knew we wanted to talk to them in pairs. One is just a whole lot easier to talk to a minor when their parent or caregiver is with you. So that helped us so, you know, from an ethics review point of view. Um, but also we were very interested in the dynamic between the two, right? One of the secondary questions that we're interested in is the decision making process. Okay, and this is, this is kind of new in camp research, this idea that families engage in a decision-making process to arrive at camp and many other decisions about the use of summertime. Uh, but we wanted to see that play out in real time. We wanted to see how parents and caregivers interact in that way. So there you go, there's, the, there's why we had this sample. Um, originally it was about 430 uh, campers and their parents. And the idea was that over the course of three years, we would talk to them in the spring and the fall. So it'd be before camp, but kind of at the end of the school year, and then again at the fall, uh, which would be after camp, but sort of at the beginning of the school year. So we'd be able to, to look at the effects of camp and look at the effects of school and look at how these things play together, okay? So what we found after three years of surveys, and I would say we, uh, I'd say we also followed this up with in-depth interviews, uh, was so what we ended up with all of this um, is a ton of data, a ton of data that our team is still swimming through as far as, as, far as I know, um, and three major findings, okay? So three, three major findings. I think you're gonna start to, start to like some of this stuff is gonna start to click because you've, you've heard this now, okay? So I'm gonna, uh, start, at the, start at the top, which in a, I probably spend the most on this one because I think this has the most implications for our work, and that is that quality camp programs lead to developmental outcomes. Okay, we've heard this term quality quite a bit. I want to start by unpacking quality because it's not a term we use loosely or willy-nilly. It doesn't refer to um, a super fun program or a super exclusive program or a super fancy program. Quality just doesn't mean it's good. And it's not something that we use to say um, that some camps can have it and they don't. Quality is actually a scientific framework for how staff interact with young people to promote developmental outcomes consistently over time. Okay, so I'll say this again. Program quality is, a, is an evidence-based framework for staff behaviors, actually uh, things that staff do and say and how they create space and culture that help promote developmental outcomes over time. So what we found is that these things that staff can do and say are the best predictors of lasting outcomes. This is a really big deal. Um, a really big deal for three, three reasons that I'm going to go into in a minute, but I, what I, what I want to also add to that is that we did not find evidence for what we would assume would have been the biggest predictor of outcomes, and that is dosage. Time spent at camp. We really expected to see, and I think we all wanted to see, that more camp is always better. I think we've lived that, some of us, we'd like to see that in our programs, that did not bear out in the data. How we're able to test that is in this longitudinal sample, this group of nine and 10 year olds that we recruited in year one, some went to camp that summer and then never returned. Some went to camp and then, you know, their world blew up with COVID and they returned, but it was a very different camp. Some went to camp four, six, eight weeks every single summer. So we had this built-in control group where we could, we could look at this dosage. I mean, if I had a penny for every time someone asked me, what's the magic number? You tell me, we're, we're restructuring our program. How many weeks of camp does a kid need? The answer is all the weeks or none of the weeks. It doesn't matter. 
it's a high quality program, that program is going to produce the outcomes that we want. So this is, this is a big deal for, for that reason and a couple others I'd like to describe for you. One is that program quality is actionable. Y'all, we can do this. We know how to do program quality. There are tools and resources that exist. I didn't make them up. They're out there in the world. One of, our, one of the thought leaders in the space is the Weikert Center for Youth Program Quality. And we partnered with Weikert Center almost 20 years ago to adapt one of their original tools, the program quality assessment, tool to CAMPs. It's a tool that uh, some of you might have used. It's the CAMP program quality assessment tool. Well, as science does, the thinking around program quality evolved and the Weikert Center created another tool called the social emotional learning program quality assessment tool for CAMP, or for, uh, didn't have the CAMP, we worked with them to add the CAMP. So now it's been adapted to CAMP. Um, in addition to assessment tools, we have training opportunities, we have workbooks. Program quality is a thing that ex exists and it's available to you right now. I think that this is, this is especially exciting, the actionability of program quality in the day and the age when our sole mission is to get more campers to camp. Because now we know that it's not about more camp, it's about better camp, okay? So program quality, exciting because it is actionable. Program quality is also exciting because what we call evidence. Okay, so this whole idea of the magic of camp and how that doesn't really sell with funders and even parents today are saying, show me my money. I wanna know the ROI of this camp, right? Fun doesn't cut it, magic doesn't cut it, but program quality has been identified by major funders, including the federal government, as a source of evidence. So when we're now entering into the space of trying to partner with schools, trying to seek funding, that has been reserved uh, perhaps for educational interventions, program quality is what we need to tell the story of camp. Last but not least is this connection to outcomes, right? Program quality has very often been this um, kind of either or. So oh, we're gonna either measure outcomes and tell the story of what campers get out of camp, or we can invest our time and energy into assessing the process. So it's process versus product, which one are we gonna do? Uh, we don't have time for both. Well, the answer is that program quality is linked to outcomes. We can now say, we know that we can control the program quality. We know we can improve it. We can't necessarily control outcomes. So if I have to choose, I need to invest in program quality. That helps me train my staff. That helps me design my programs, and that is something I know I can improve over time. And then look, we have the data to show that that does lead to the outcomes that we're hoping for. So, program quality. Quality camp experiences lead to developmental outcomes. This is exciting, this is big, and there are tools available for you to start that right now. The second major finding uh, of the study, again, bit of a, yeah, no duh, but pretty huge implications, especially for where we're at right now in terms of social emotional learning, and that is that camps and schools are mutually, or camp and school experiences, I'm sorry, are mutually complementary, mutually enforcing, reinforcing experiences. Okay? So we found for the first time that a camp experience, indeed, uh, a quality camp experience, let's make sure I say that, a quality camp experience can indeed prepare a young person for a quality experience in school. And it's when they have a quality camp experience and they go in and have a high quality school experience that then they achieve the outcomes and the growth over time that we're hoping to see. It's not one or the other, right? You know, we always wanna say camp is better than school, we're great, we, I mean, we are great, and we can keep saying that, but when it comes to partnering with schools, and when it comes to working with parents to say, here's why this camp experience is essential, we can now say, it's because these two things work together. Better camp experiences lead to better school experiences, and when those two things are synergistic, then the types of outcomes that we're hoping young people are learning and we know they need develop and last over time, okay? So you've probably heard a lot about camp school partnerships. This is now the data that we need to take to schools and districts and say that these are mutually enforcing relationships. This is also a big part of our DE&I story, our diversity, equity, inclusion story, right? We know, and this is actually our third major finding, we know that there are significant barriers to camp attendance. We know that. What if we can unleash school resources and bring whole classrooms, whole schools to camp, right? And help schools achieve their social emotional outcomes. 
So that's a big one. Camps and schools are mutually enforcing, but we cannot say that without also acknowledging that it can go the opposite direction. Positive camp ex school, uh, school experience leads to a positive school experience, and the reverse holds true. A negative camp experience does not set a young person up for success in school. We don't like to hear this, that we could possibly do harm. But it's all about the ecosystem. The more we understand that camps are a part of an ecosystem, this is a very exciting thing. But the more we understand, we know that every single part of an ecosystem is interconnected. What's good for one part is good for another. What harms one part harms the rest. So I couldn't be more confident in the call to action in this. Our responsibility couldn't be more clear, especially given now what we know about program quality and we have the tools to do it, right? But now the responsibility is to bring those tools and make sure that every single young person leaves our camp prepared for school, prepared to thrive in school. So this leads beautifully into the third finding, which, which really does kind of hit that, our, our DE&I piece on the head, and, and it's this. So I, I shared with you that we intentionally uh, spoke with parents and, or sorry, a caregiver and their camper, because we were interested in that decision-making kind of interaction. How, who makes a decision? How is that decision navigated? Who seals the deal? How did it reflect back on camp? Is it the camper, is it the parent, is it together? Okay. We also knew that we were talking to nine-year-olds. I don't know if you've ever interacted with a nine-year-old, but you ask a nine-year-old about, what are you learning at camp? And they say, I don't know. Right? So we knew we needed some interpretation <laughs> from, a, from a parent or caregiver that might be able to help us unpack that a little bit. And what we found in this, this interaction between parents and caregivers is that decision-making is indeed quite complex. Okay, there are a lot of factors that go into decision making. There's a lot of back and forth. The decision making um, process changes as a young person ages. It does get turned over more to the young person or driven more to the young person and their interest, but the parent or the caregiver is still the one out there filling out the forms and paying the bills. And so, you know, the dynamic changes and we know that. But perhaps most interesting, not new, but interesting in this is that decision making process is predicted by the things we might expect it to be predicted by. And that is race, that is income, and that is family experience at camp. Okay? So we know that the pathways to camp, from a moment a family decides to send a child to camp to the moment that child shows up at camp, that pathway is predicted, is determined, is shaped by the same structural factors that are enabling some kids to go to camp and some not to go to camp. They're allowing some kids to show up at camp and feel like they look like everybody else and some kids to show up at camp and they look like nobody, right? So we looked at this in terms of constraints. We looked at this in terms of, you know, we might call these barriers, but constraints is a way to think about once a family decides to send a child to camp, what is really constraining that forward motion, right? And so we looked at that in terms of um, kind of psychological constraints, worries, concerns, things that families um, who have already decided to send a child to camp still have to contend with. And we might think that one of the, the major constraints um, is a financial constraint. And yes, it is a, there, are, there are financial constraints, especially for uh, populations that I just mentioned, but camps actually do a really good job removing a financial constraint. You know, as an industry, we're providing, I don't know, upwards of 80% um, of, of scholarship dollars or 80% of kids uh, going to camp receive scholarship dollars. I should know the statistic, but, you know, let's just go with an 80%. Point is that we got that part figured out. What we don't have figured out are perhaps the most basic constraints. Where's my kid going to sleep? Are they going to be able to change in privacy? What about showering? What about eating? Are they gonna like the food, right? So some of these most basic needs were actually significant constraints for families, and especially uh, families who don't necessarily have that family experience at camp. They don't know, no one in their family's ever gone to camp, right? Or they might also be experiencing significant barriers in terms of financial access to camp. And so on top of filling out the forms and worrying and all these things, then you gotta worry about what your kid eats. So what we know is that the pathway to camp is characterized by the same structural factors that are creating extra work and extra labor for young people in all kinds of ways. And what I, what I think is really curious in that is that, like I said, we've, we're got, we've gotten pretty good at removing you know, that financial barrier. 
But what happens when a camper shows up at camp and has adopted some of the anxiety, some of the concern that their parent has had to navigate? And so they show up at camp perhaps not looking or having the same kind of experience as, the, as, as most of the other kids at camp, and they're also exhausted. They're also exhausted because of how much work it took to camp, get to camp. I don't have an answer here, y'all. I don't have an answer, but I do think the, the, the tale in here, yes, is removal of barriers, understanding barriers, and also thinking about the camp experiences far more than when a young person shows up and when they leave. What's the moment they make the decision to camp? come to camp, and then what can we do to support that? Let's back that up even further. How do, we, how do we get people to make decisions to come to camp who might have had negative connotations at camp, negative experiences at camp, negative cultural association, associations at camp? There's a whole world to unlock in terms of that decision-making process, and I believe we've tapped into it, but we have a lot of work to do. So I'm almost there, y'all, and, and what I want to do is bring this back around to uh, the, the question you might have come to get answered, and that is, why is this the research that I've been looking for? Why is this the research I've been looking for, and I don't necessarily, I didn't really know it. Um, this is the research you've been looking for because it's the research you need to take to those doubters, and they're there. This is the research you can take to parents. I do think that parents are becoming consumers of research. You know, whereas it used to be only our maybe for-profit camp or our not-for-profit camps are looking for funding, I do think that everyone now needs to show parents the return on their investment. So here you go. Okay, this is the research that we need to take to our partners and say this is an entire learning space now rich with evidence that does not exist in an isolated way. It exists as part of an ecosystem. It exists as a part of an ecosystem that only some people have access to. What can we do to make sure every young person has access to it in a way that is culturally relevant and sustaining to them so that they leave better to go back to their communities and serve their communities, right? This is the research that you need to affirm, affirm the great and vital work that you do. You are not alone in this work. You're not alone in feeling like you have to fight, you have to convince people to explain camp. You're not alone, and that won't go away. But I hope that this affirms to you that you're not alone in this ecosystem either, that you're part of a, a rich developmental landscape, and camp is an important role, and what you do is not uh, floating above a field somewhere, as one of my mentors once said. It's actually deeply connected to the world around it. I don't know if any of you are Ted Lasso fans. I'm a Ted Lasso fan. The new season of Ted Lasso is coming out. I have watched the trailer many times, and Ted Lasso says in this trailer, if seeing is believing, then I believe we've been seen. Y'all, we've been seen. And this might have been what we got there. But now it's up for you, up to you, to take it. Well, thank you. <laughs>